As I noted, it's often very difficult to be able to survey or determine the income of persuasion. And so as a consequence, scholars of communication often look at behavioral willingness. The following example is used to describe what a self-reported behavior might look like if you were to see it on a survey. Imagine you saw this question. If the cost were the same as conventional electricity, how likely would you be to convert to solar energy? Very likely? Somewhat likely? I'd need to know more. Unlikely? Or very unlikely? That scale seeks not to determine whether or not you did or did not already purchase solar, but what your current attitude is towards solar and whether they can move you along a scale or a continuum to be more favorable towards perhaps purchasing green energy or solar energy in this case. While we can survey for a whole lot of attitudes and behaviors, especially as it relates to something like your willingness to buy solar energy or the likelihood to purchase a particular water heater, it often gets more difficult when we talk about things like your preponderance to be classist or your feelings towards people from disproportionate populations or marginalized populations. Right? People don't admit they're racist. And so on surveys, it's more difficult to determine things like implicitly measured attitudes. And so communication scholars and those who study arguments have faced a particular challenge to identify ways that we might address audiences or receivers' arguments in ways that they might not be prepared to understand that they already hold. These forms of implicit attitudes can be difficult to survey and sense out because sometimes attitudes are not as readily accessible. While some things like a cockroach might readily elicit the ew response, other things are a little bit more ambiguous, and so it can be difficult to determine how those attitudes are formed by individual receivers or full collective audiences. Consequently, if audiences don't have the previous experience or knowledge, or if they're otherwise not interested, it might take longer to activate their interests. Marketers have become really adept at learning what techniques can motivate audiences. And they've also become really adept at knowing what attitudes motivate audiences, even when the audiences themselves might not be aware that they share or hold those very attitudes. So for instance, we all tend to think that we're very unique or that we like very niche and independent things, but we also like to know what's most popular. And so when something pops up on Amazon with a whole lot of stars and reviews, we tend to go for it or otherwise assume that it's a better product. And so that same caliber or that same quality that likes to be niche and unique and novel has to be balanced by the dialectical tension that we simultaneously enjoy knowing the reviews and the collective consciousness of others. And in the context of health, social marketing, or even political campaigns, you'll often see what's called a social norming campaign. Social norming campaigns rely on creating a structure of what is socially acceptable and normal, and then making an argument that either you should join in with what is normal, or you should avoid the deviant behavior from that is, which is not normal. And so this relies on knowing audiences and individuals' norm accessibility, or the ease with which they can identify their own associations, attitudes, and beliefs. It also suggests that membership within a particular group, what is popular or what is not popular, is central to our self-concept, and that by accessing that through marketing and advertising, we might elicit more strong motivations from consumer responses. This is really important because in-groups might be just simply temporarily associated with even just being named as a group. We'll talk more about that as we transfer into our next lecture about social identity theory. And so in this sense, both our identities, our attitudes, and the social norms all come together to influence how people perceive and define social problems. Accessible attitudes and norms that are otherwise stronger in association tend to have more effects on behavior than those that are least accessible or least recognizable. We might identify some examples of positive social norming campaigns. You see these often in health campaigns and they're frequently used even around college campuses. Here's one that you see from the Colorado Boulder University that says students drink less than you think. The average number of drinks consumed per week at CBU is 2.2. So this tries to create a normative concept how much is a normal amount of drinking, what is binge drinking, and what is an acceptable amount of drinking, and what are the majority of individuals who are on that campus doing. Presumably, students would see this message, and if they were binge drinkers, go, oh my goodness, I'm drinking excessively, I don't fit what most people are doing, I should get help or I should rein in my consumption. Others who perhaps do not drink would see that and know that drinking is acceptable, but only in moderation and in a safe, consumable environment. 
So social norm campaigns are effective because they create a structured number or an assumption about what the general population is doing, what is considered acceptable and deviant behavior, and then they try to lead their audiences or receivers to otherwise buy into the general population of acceptable behavior and avoid the otherwise marginal population of unacceptable behavior. Here we see two additional examples. The first, I think, leads us with some problems or concerns, as it notes that 99% believe that fighting or street violence is a problem. Well, I would hope that 99% think that, and so perhaps that particular statistic is not as evocative. However, the second that says 74% of college men would intervene to prevent a sexual assault similarly raises questions. What the hell is wrong with the other 26%? I'm not sure that that social norm campaign is as nearly effective as it would have thought it was, and you can tell by its text and its copy and pasteness, it's clearly a bit dated. And so we would hope that those numbers are surely higher on the right and perhaps more realistic as we think about the claims we structure on the left there.